Our second reading is taken from 1 Peter, and this will serve as the basis for this morning's sermon. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him, you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. The word of the Lord. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. It's... um, sometimes called the post-project blues. You've been working on this thing for days, weeks, months, maybe years. You have poured your heart and soul into it. You've stayed up late. Your family has sacrificed for you. And and now it's done. And you just kind of feel empty and a little bit lost. It's that similar feeling when you finish a really good book, and now that the characters are over and the world is over and you just kind of miss it, and you, you just feel left adrift. Now what? It, it's the question that Peter answers for us today. Jesus is risen. You can call upon God as your Father because you are a, a child of God. Now what? Be afraid. It's not the answer we were really expecting. I mean, how many uh, of our hymns are focused on, especially our favorite hymns, are focused on not being afraid? How many sermons do I preach about about not being afraid? And and how many Bible passages do we memorize and and share with someone about our our confidence and trust and, and not being afraid? Well, that's all true. We are not afraid of God as if He is this slave driver, and we are serving under him under fear of death. Our um, NIV translation is, is actually not literal here, which goes a long way in helping explain what's going on. So literally it says, since you call on a father who judges each person's works impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in fear. And the NIV says in reverent fear. Don't be afraid of God as as in if you're not good enough, He's going to punish you. Don't be afraid that God is going to change His mind about saving you. But recognize, this is God you are dealing with. This is not your your loving grandpa who doesn't care what you do. Recognize how much greater He is than you are. Recognize how much he gave to save you. Recognize the price he paid, how deep his love is for you. Be afraid of doing anything that would destroy his perfect loving relationship that God has given you by becoming your father. Imagine that in your living room is a $500,000 vase or, or vase that your mother purchased. For I don't know why, but basically that vase... That is your inheritance. Are you going to take out your baseball glove and go into the living room and stand next to it and and play catch? Is the living room right next to that vase the uh, appropriate place to practice your golf swing or your uh, WWE wrestling moves? I mean, chances are you know what you're doing and you're not going to break the vase, but, but do you really want to risk that? Jesus died and rose from the dead. You can call upon God as your Father. Now what? Do I just go and live however I want? Do do I dare act like my faith and life in Christ are are worthless? That you know, if I think that I am a Christian, I, I'm I'm fine. You know, I went to church. I was a member somewhere. I, I can mess around with sin, and it, it's not going to hurt me. I can just ask God for forgiveness anyway. Be afraid. 
Be afraid that you don't despise the precious gifts God has given you and so lose them. Because this is a far more dangerous gamble than, than playing games next to your mother's vase. Despising God's spiritual gifts to us, it really shows itself clearly when we uh, forget that we're just foreigners here. This earth isn't our home. We are like somebody who's traveling across the country and it's getting late, so you stop and spend the night in a motel. You, you know, eat, eat some food, you sleep in the bed. What you don't do is take the TV and put it in your car or, or take the mattress and try and shove it in the back of your minivan. It, it's not your stuff. You are a temporary guest in that hotel room. It doesn't belong to you. We are just passing through this earth. And yet we live like our earthly possessions are the most important thing in the world. Like, like being successful, getting a good job, going to a good school, buying whatever it is that's going to make me happy. That, like that's more important than the eternal possessions God has won for me. I, I live like my earthly relationships are the most important things as, as if I need my friends or my, my girlfriends to like me above all else, even at the cost of my faith. Earthly possessions are just temporary, like items in a motel room. And if I put all of my focus on and this life, then the reality is that those earthly relationships are, are just as temporary too. Because without God, those relationships and, and everything I own, they're, they're empty. Whether it's a person or an object, they're essentially worthless to me, and I inevitably end up using them for my own selfish uh, purposes and pleasure. God is not an indulgent grandfather who doesn't care what you do. And one day you will stand before him, and I will stand before him as the holy judge who judges each person's work impartially. So it's not going to matter if you were rich or poor. It's not going to matter if you were born extra crabby or, or extra patient. It's not going to matter if you uh, think you lived a decent life. If you can call yourself a Christian and, and, and you can call yourself a member of a church. Martin Luther goes so far as to say, God will not judge according to whether you are only called a Christian. No, he will ask you, if you are a Christian, then tell me. Where are the fruits with which you can show your faith? God judges each according to their work. All right, hold on a second. Because aren't we saved by grace alone through faith alone? Aren't we, don't we maintain that we are justified by faith apart from works so that no one can boast? Yes, exactly. We are. Uh, faith alone justifies. Faith in Christ alone saves that's undoubtedly what the Bible teaches. So what is Peter getting at in this verse? Well, how can you say God will judge me by my work? If you come to a fruit tree and it's got no leaves on it, it's, the wood is dry, there's no fruit on it, you can safely assume that tree is dead. If you come to a tree that is covered in apples, it's living and thriving. Where there is faith, there are fruits of faith. Where, where there is faith, there are works pleasing to God. The, the work is merely evidence of the presence or absence of faith. So in that sense, it is not wrong for Peter to say, God will judge each according to his work. That, that is the public evidence that all people can see of whether you have faith or not. So it's like saying you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. Now that fire may be a, a little ember, a, a little smoldering wick, but there is still some smoke coming off of it. What is not true is no matter what, that smoke does not make the fire. Your works don't make your faith. Your works don't save you. You are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and the evidence is those works, those fruits of faith that God will judge. That means that, that no Christian is exempt from this judgment that is coming, but we don't have to be afraid. We are, we are happy to be judged by our God. We don't have to worry about, well, how, how do I know that I have enough works, that I have made my faith good enough? That's not how it works 
if there is faith there, then you can trust in confidence in this. It was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. There's nothing to be afraid of on Judgment Day because your sins have been covered by the blood of God's own Son. He redeemed us. He bought you back from the empty way of life of this materialistic world. He, he paid the ransom price to free you from slavery to sin and death. He made the payment that was required to cover your debt. We, we can't begin to comprehend the price that Jesus paid. One drop of God's blood would have been enough to pay for the world's sins many times over, and yet Jesus saw fit to pour out all of his lifeblood for us. He became God's sacrificial lamb. The, lamb. the lambs that God required, they had to be the best of the best. They had to be perfect outwardly, without blemish, not, no sickness, no, no birth defects, and their blood shed, let the Israelites know that blood was required to cover their sins. And Jesus far exceeds the picture that those lambs painted of him. Jesus was perfect. Not in this outward way, but, but inwardly perfect through and through. Not an ounce of sin on him, no deceit on his lips, no, no selfishness. His life was characterized by love of people and love of God's will. He had no blemish or defect. And that's the blood that was spilled to make lowly sinners like you and me blameless children of God. Jesus completely changes our relationship with God and that is the only reason that we can call upon Him as our Father. That we can come before Him with confidence. And this was God's plan all along. As He was creating the world, as He created Adam and Eve holy and perfect, he knew that they were going to need a Savior. He knew they would fall. He, he, before the creation of the world, he chose his Son to be that Savior. Now, the world had to wait thousands of years for that, that seed of Adam and Eve that would crush the serpent's head to appear. But now in these last times, he has been revealed for your sake. I don't know which is harder to believe. That God chose His Son to save the world. That, that Jesus gave up His blood for a world that rejected Him. That He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Or that Jesus was chosen for you personally. That, that Jesus shed His blood on the cross for you. That He is the Lamb of God that takes away your sin. That God has directed history so that He could reveal Christ to you in His Word. And so it's through Jesus you believe in God who raised Him from the dead and glorified Him. That, that He loved you so much, He purchased and won you from, from death with His own blood. God proved the payment was enough when He raised His Son from the dead and glorified Him for His work. And so your faith and your hope are in God. And if your faith and your hope are in God, that doesn't mean that you have to live afraid of, of whether you have done enough to be saved. You don't put your hope in your good behavior. You don't fear that God is going to punish you for your sins. Because it's all been taken care of. It is finished. Your faith and hope are in Christ's blood shed for you. Your faith and hope are in that you were baptized into Christ and you were buried with Him and so you will be raised with Him. Your, your faith and hope are in that you are a child of God because as, as many as are baptized into Christ have clothed themselves with Christ. Your faith and hope have, uh, and of your salvation have nothing to do with you and everything to do with Christ for you. So now what? Live in awe of what Christ has done for you. Live in reverence for a God who has done so much for you. Cherish and guard the precious gift God has given you above all else. Now what? Live as foreigners here, as strangers to this earth, knowing that, that this is not your home, but heaven is your home. And that is what gives you purpose and fulfillment to your life because, because you know that your acts of love here 
will ripple throughout eternity. That all of your possessions are, are no longer things to hoard for yourselves, but, but resources that you can use to love and serve others. As a redeemed child of God, every person relationship that you have, it, it takes on a new meaning. Because no longer is anyone there for you to use selfishly. Uh, no, they're not there so that you can use them for your own gratification. They're not even there for you to use as a means to an end. As if I am going to be nice to that person because then God's going to be happy with me and I'll go to heaven. You're already going to heaven. God already loves you. You don't have to prove anything. You don't need anything. And that means that you can love that person for the sake of loving that person. And you can love that person for the sake of Christ. Now what? Live your life in faith and hope in Christ. Amen. The peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus.